Good evening and very warm greetings from Beijing. My name is Alberto Nino and I am the General Counsel of the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. Let me extend a warm welcome to everyone joining this session on the occasion of AIB's sixth annual meeting, which is being hosted by the United Arab Emirates and taking place by virtual means. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. AIIB is delighted to bring its annual meeting to the Middle East for the first time and to join national and international celebrations such as the Golden Jubilee in the UAE and the World Expo in Dubai. I'm honored to be hosting this event, which counts with the participation and support of AIB's more than 100 approved member countries, representing 80% of the world population and 65% of the global GDP. I may also use this opportunity to welcome our newest member approved just one hour ago, Nigeria. Tonight, we will be discussing the role of multilateral development banks in developing and promoting environment and social and governance principles and standards ESG. The topic is very timely as ESG is now a regular part of conversations ranging from dinner tables to boardrooms. The topic is also very consistent with the official team of AIB's annual meeting this year, investing today, transforming tomorrow. In today's world, we cannot think about investments based only on economic returns, such as in the past. Sound investments must comprise solid environmental, social, and governance approaches. In fact, as we approach important global conferences about climate change in Glasgow and biodiversity in Kuming, sustainable finance is not only vital for the viability of the economy, but also for the survival of our planet. We have a special panel for you tonight, and I am now privileged to introduce our panelists. First, Sheila Agarwal Khan. Sheila is the director. Uh, Sheila is the director of the Economy Division at the United Nations Environment Program, and brings to the to this position more than thirty years of management and technical expertise from a range of institutions. Sheila was previously the director of Green Climate Finance Fund and Global Environment Facility Operations at the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, IUCN. Under Sheila's leadership at IUCN, the program grew from the two largest global environment funding mechanisms fivefold, increasingly bringing the actors from the banking, investment, and insurance sectors alongside those from sectors such as energy and agriculture. Then, my former colleague from the World Bank, Charles DeLeva. Charles is an independent advisor and leading authority on international environmental law and environmental and social standards. He held positions in the World Bank and other international organizations for over 30 years. Requested to come out of retirement, he served for from 2018 until 2021 as the World Bank's chief officer, environmental and social standards, where he oversaw the Environmental Social Framework for Investment Project Finance, of which he was the lead author. He also served as Chief Counsel Environmental and International Law between 2004 and 2016 at the World Bank, where he led a diverse practice group responsible for environmental and social safeguards, climate change law, and climate finance. Charles represented the bank at almost every landmark event for the UN Climate Change Convention, Paris Agreement and Biodiversity Convention, and led the bank's accreditation to the Global Environmental Facility and the Green Climate Fund. Finally, Nicholas Grabar. Nick is a partner at the top international law firm, Clearly, Gottlieb, Steen, and Hamilton, LLP. His practice focuses on international capital markets and security regulations, and on the representation of large reporting companies. Nick is the co-chair uh, of Cleary's sustainability practice group and has been involved in the issues of green bonds for a range of sovereign and corporate clients, including uh, he plays a primary role in the firm's work for public company clients, including leading a Mexican and Brazilian businesses, sovereigns and global investment banks on the biggest and most complex capital markets and financial matters. Nick repeatedly has been recognized for his work on behalf of clients, including by the American lawyer, Chambers Global, Chambers Latin America, Chambers USA, 
the League of 500 Latin America, and IFLR 1000, among others. In 2016, Latin lawyer named Nick, its International Lawyer of the Year, describing him as an elite deal maker with a reputation for assisting on novel financing structures that set precedents for others to follow. As you can see, a terrific topic to match a terrific panel before us. Therefore, without further ado, I'd like to start by posing a question to all three panelists as a warm-up question for tonight's session. So if I may, can you see, and if so, how, the new ESG approaches accelerating the transition to sustainable infrastructure? Let me ask Sheila to go first, then Charles and Nick. Good evening, Sheila. Thank you very much for being with us tonight. The floor is yours. Thank you, Alberto. Um, definitely, we're seeing a growth in um, um, investment uh, towards environment and social governance criteria and principles. Um, as you may know, um, the UN Environment Program manages a partnership with banks, with investors and insurance players. And we're seeing, a, let's say, a, a big push in terms of the, how this industry is looking at the interests in um, investment along environment and social governance structures. Right now we have principles for sustainable banking, insurance and investment, and we're seeing assets um, from the, you know, the large, um, let's say range of investors coming in. As you know, there are assets from asset owners that are in the order of 70 trillion US dollars and recently in the Financial Times, um, there was a very good article there about the growth that um, is being witnessed globally on environmental and social governance criteria coming into investments. The OECD has said that some 6.9 trillion in investment opportunities are available on sustainable infrastructure and not yet capitalized on. And so we see a real opportunity here for the multilateral development banks to engage in this space in a kind of public-private partnership approach where they could, let's say, catalyze growth in this area. Thank you very much, Sheila. Charles, uh, what do you have to say about that? I think multilateral development banks like AIIB and World Bank certainly have a role to play in assisting the growth of the sustainable finance that you mentioned, Alberto. And one reason why the MDBs are well positioned to do so is because they've worked for many years to harmonize their environmental, social, and governance standards. And one of the challenges that exists in the ESG world today um, is the need for a greater uh, consistency in the definition of terms, in the criteria that are used uh, in order to avoid risks of greenwashing. And so I think, you know, as we discussed today, the biggest challenge to ESG and its critical role in achieving the sustainability that you, you spoke to, Alberto, is the credibility of the market and avoiding greenwashing. And because MDBs have such a comprehensive approach to the key principles of accountability, transparency, enforceability, consistency, MDBs can really help um, set the benchmark for how to enhance the, the credibility of the ESG approach uh, more broadly. So that's really key. Thank you very much, Charles. Uh, Nick, like... Uh... The other panelists, you have been working on a big infrastructure projects for a long time, but from the private sector vintage point. Can I have your take on the same question, please? Sure, thank you. And, and thank you very much. It's an honor to be speaking with this group. I am a, uh, I'm a humble practitioner and less expert than the rest of our group tonight, but I am a skeptic on the efficacy of the sustainable finance market. And I'll quickly tell you why. There are three steps for the effectiveness of sustainable investing. There's investors directing their investment managers to pursue sustainable investment. There's investment managers directing funding to actors in the economy who are in a position to pursue sustainable infrastructure investment. And then there is the use of the funds by those actors 
to achieve sustainable infrastructure objectives. The first two steps are in excellent shape. The mobilization of investors, the mobilization of asset managers towards sustainable finance, uh, the ability of asset managers to bring funding to bear with actors in the, in the economy who are in a position to invest, that's working very well. The third step, ensuring that those actors make investments that are really effective towards the sustainability goals that we all share, that step I think can still use some work. And there I see an important role for multilateral development banks, um, but I will be a skeptic until I see effective mechanisms to make sure that investments really get made in sustainable infrastructure um, at the same level as they're being made in sustainable assets and sustainable investment products. Thank you very much, Nick. Um, Sheila, uh, Charles uh, sketched for us, you know, uh, a potential role for the MDBs. While Nick, you know, as a pragmatism, you know, and uh, and and uh, representing private clients, you know, some showed some skepticism about some of the issues. I know that and that's precisely a focus, uh, one of the focus that you have for some years now, including with your leadership, is trying to address being a realist. Uh, and not only an idealist. Can you tell us a little bit, are there principles that the UNEP uses to enable countries to think through their plans for sustainable infrastructure? And if so, how does that work? Thanks. Um, just earlier this year, UNEP um, released the principles for sustainable infrastructure, um, developed with a lot of partners, you know, and setting out some 10 principles. Um, the idea is that public planners in countries would be able to use them and look at it rather than a deal by deal is to look at it more systematically across the country in terms of their infrastructure plans. I think like Nicholas, we're thinking that, you know, at the end of the day to be able to put them into practice and really, you know, to avoid, let's say, greenwashing that Nicholas spoke to, what kind of effective mechanisms is that I think the MDBs here have to play a critical role in setting up innovative financing mechanisms that can harness and catalyze private and, and public investment from the countries themselves, being able to maybe buy, bring down that risk, but create some kind of, let's say, an investment platform, but where you have these kind of standards and principles that um, can be looked at in a way almost like a third party um, with third party validation process and all that so that there's no greenwashing, but yet the kind of standard, let's say more systematic mechanism to be able to bring in um, other sources of finance. Thank you, Sheila. Let me see if there are any comments from my colleagues from the panel. Nick, would that do the, do, do, do the trick? That is exactly the kind of thing that I'm talking about. I, I should say my professional life is representing the uh, issuers of sustainability linked assets. And our clients uh, all take very seriously their undertakings uh, to make investments towards sustainability objectives. I think it's important for the term greenwashing not to be misunderstood as suggesting some kind of cynicism or um, or uh, uh, misdeeds on the part of uh, those who invest under a green label and those who borrow under a green label. But I, the, the institutions that seek to invest sustainably um, almost all do it very much in good faith and with a, a, a real commitment to the objectives. Um, so the kind of thing that Sheila is talking about, which is helping uh, actors in the economy, recipients of funds, to make intelligent investments that are effective towards sustainability objectives, that's where I think there's uh, there's room for room for growth, room for improvement, and that the kind of thing that uh, Sheila is talking about is just what the market needs. Thank you, Nick. Let me take the group now back to the basics. Charles has been uh, working, building, evaluating, implementing environment and social governance principles, you know, for more than 30 years. So, Charles, in today's world, what are the objectives that we should be looking at uh, 
uh, ESG and what does you know ESG really mean both in theory and practice if you look back since Rio 92 and where we are today? That's a great question. And I think the world is still looking to uh, find implementation of those 92 uh, Rio principles that the international community agreed to uh, in uh, 20 plus, uh, you know, 30, 30 years ago now. And I think what's key here, and I think we, I, I have a sense we uh, all agree on this, is there is a lot of goodwill amongst MDBs, and now we see in the private sector to, to have investment reach those goals of sustainable development. But what we need um, is to address the details in a way that give credibility for the international community to think we are making progress. And I think what we've, what we've seen, uh, going to the points that Nick and Sheila were making about the need, for example, monitoring, is that uh, proposals are made that seem to meet general ESG criteria, but then how do we know the criteria are actually being met in the field? COVID, clearly the pandemic has made it difficult for monitoring a lot of the kinds of activities that investors hope are being uh, carried out with their funds. Um, you know, many key that are highly linked to climate impacts, extractive industries are, are often in very difficult places to monitor. And this goes back to your question about the role of multilateral development. They are in many uh, challenging situations in the world where these key environmental and social impacts are taking place, and they can help the private sector see to it that their investments are reaching the goals, the criteria that are set out under the ESG criteria. And in addition, through their lending instruments can have, a, a, have an approach toward the accountability system if those criteria, if those indicators are actually not being met. And I think that's the challenge that we're seeing with a lot of the private investment is, do they have the, the, the capability of having the accountability, the transparency, the monitoring on the ground to match the tremendous engine of their, of their investments that are taking place? Thank you, Charles. I will come back to you in some of these building blocks that you mentioned, COVID and climate change, and see if we are on the same page with respect to ESG. And we have some questions, you know, coming in uh, for us to, to, to address. But for the, for the moment, let me move then into the instruments. We talk about, you know, common principles. We talked about, you know, the public sector, the MDBs. And, but I'd like to ask and address a question to uh, Nick. How are you seeing the practice involving in the fixed income securities markets for ESG related instruments and markets? Can you please share with us the challenging and opportunities in this area in your practice? Thank you, Nick. Sure, thank you. A really interesting thing has happened with tremendous speed in the market for sustainable investment. And I search in vain for an analogy of comparably rapid development, and that is the development under unofficial auspices of refined and reasonably uniform market practices among participants. Um, this has been stimulated by international agencies and especially stimulated by um, the ICMA and by uh, European industry groups. Um, I, it's interesting to me that these market practices have developed without much involvement on the part of regulators and uh, without much involvement of regulation uh, generally. There's in effect a kind of uh, voluntary code of conduct that governs uh, sustainable investment in the capital markets and it's uh, been developed by the industry. It's different from other comparable past uh, 
developments of market practices, you can think about how the International Swap Dealers Association created standard documentation for the swap industry 30 some years ago with the, the, uh, the way in which uh, loan documentation and trading has become standardized under industry auspices. Uh, the difference here is that these market standards don't generally bear on the creation of binding contractual provisions. So we have a, a market in which uh, regulators are weakly involved and in which the market practices relate to the conduct of investors and especially of issuers of these assets, but not to the binding contracts they entered into. It is the, the, the positive side of that is that it's a, a very large and broad voluntary development um, undertaken by uh, with a, a relatively low level of cynicism in, in spite of the term uh, greenwashing. The challenge of the way that has grown up is that uh, relatively little of these standards are binding on participants and that uh, has created these three big challenges of this market. And, and we've alluded to all of these already in the remarks uh, of, the, of, uh, of Charles and Sheila. The problem of verification, how do you know whether the funding that has been mobilized is actually being applied towards sustainable purposes? The problem of efficacy, how do you know whether those investments actually work for that purpose? And the problem of comparability, uh, how can investors facing a complicated investment universe uh, be sure that they're making good decisions when they compare one investment to another. You, you asked about the specific instruments that have been developed and there are there are really two in, in uh, type. One is an instrument, uh, uh, a, a standard fixed income instrument. And when I say standard, I mean it resembles other instruments in the fixed income markets to the extent possible in terms of its tenor um, its uh, payment schedule and so on, in which the issuer or borrower commits to use the proceeds in a certain way. People call that a use of proceeds bond. And the other kind is an instrument whose cost to the borrower depends on achieving certain specified metrics, and people refer to that as a KPI bond. There are those two varieties capture the between the two of them, the vast uh, vast, vast majority of the uh, universe of sustainable investment instruments. And use of proceeds bonds are far, are a, represent a far larger volume of financing than KPI bonds do. KPI bonds have attached a real financial cost to, I'll put it the other way around, a real financial benefit to meeting certain specifically defined sustainability metrics. And they have good verification mechanisms around them. Um, I could question their efficacy, but as far as verification, they're, they're a, a superior product. Use of proceeds bonds, the, the market rests on the commitment of the borrower to use the funds in a certain way. It, it does not rest on contractual obligations of the borrower to use the funds in those ways. Especially for the use of proceeds market, I think the big challenge is uh, the question of verification and the question of efficacy. Issuers, again, I say this again, issuers do this in good faith, but down the road when the bonds have been outstanding for a year, the reporting mechanisms are voluntary. Compliance is uh, voluntary and um, varies widely in quality. And those are areas in which I think market participants are not well equipped either to do the work of reporting on the, uh, the application of their proceeds or to do the work of assessing the um, efficacy of how those proceeds are applied. So that's what the market is doing. Um, it's a very heartening development. It's happened very fast because there are no regulators involved. Um, and I'm, I, I think uh, 
looking for grounds for optimism, um, if participants like the multilateral development banks can address these questions of how to make sure investments are effective, how to make sure investment object objectives are actually being complied with, and then um, how to make sure that investments can be efficiently compared uh, between different assets. Uh, if the MDBs can assess, can address those challenges, I think they can make a real contribution to a market that's more effective in achieving its ultimate objectives. Thank you very much, uh, Nick. I was uh, uh, smiling here because uh, here in our practice, when we talk to bankers and lawyers and economists, they seem very happy that uh, this initial phase of ESG, we don't have a lot of regulations, but some of them are starting to ask, maybe we need some regulation. Let me, let me turn this uh, point you made, uh, especially on the transparency and the verification to uh, Sheila and ask, uh, can the uh, economy or the you know, economists provide you know, some clues and UNAP you know, programs where the law is not there yet? You know? Can we have you know, some policy that give us you know, some more uh, safe direction for ESG? And then I'll turn uh, to Charles on the role of the MDBs. Thank you. So, you know, I, I, maybe I could talk a little bit about um, some experiences we've had, you know, with without having to have a regulatory environment where um, we work with a number of banks. We have some 250 banks who are some of the largest in the world working with us. They will occupy maybe 40 percent or so of the financial transactions or assets globally. And together, you know, they have set up. Um, principles for sustainable banking. The same thing is happening on the insurance side with the principles for responsible investment. And this is moving with those industry players in that space on a voluntary basis where they set targets and then they work to you know, delivering those targets. They're provided with assistance from, from UNAP and the other partners. Um, there's civil society participating in that, and then the groups have to report and have a validation process, which includes a civil society review. So it's almost like the, you could say, the checks and balances, and so that there is a validation process in there. And it seems to be giving the shareholders of these different bodies a level of confidence that they're either the banks or the insurance or other types of in institutional investors are coming on board in in a very let's say structured manner in going this route on the idea of uh, sustainable infrastructure what would be really interesting is if you had um in the absence of some of the regulatory space is number one is a kind of partnership like this where you know the different players could come together and be able to look to seeing how far is are they looking at their core business in terms of um, really looking at sustainable infrastructure and applying let's say the principles for sustainable infrastructure that we have in place or other metrics i know the world economic forum recently i think a year or so ago released um, or launched an initiative on on esg metrics and all and so it would be interesting to see how that is used but beyond the standards i think part of the process is to look at the early design and really be able to give the kind of preparation support so that you actually have the deals that already are planned right from the start with the right sustainability metrics in place, um, which could, I think, maybe help to set the stage. One of the things we're looking at is, you know, the kind of uh, policy and technical assistance that governments could, could receive from players like ourselves to be able to work with the MDBs. Um, so while we bring in the technical assistance and the policy um, kind of uh, and, uh, helping them set the enabling environment is how then can the MDBs come in with the kind of investment financing. I also wanted to raise that, you know, with Oxford, uh, UNAP has established a global recovery observatory, which is trying to track um, the level of sustainable investments and, and um, let's say financing that is going towards green recovery. So far it's showing actually quite 
very little amounts are going there, but we're hoping that as we go forward, we will start to see, you know, let's say hopefully a bigger growth in that space. Thank you, Sheila. Uh, Charles, between, you know, greater need for verification, you know, having better principles, you know, looking into partnerships in which uh, we could, you know, exchange the good and the bad experiences. How do you see the role of the MDBs in that space? Uh, certainly, I don't see a greater appetite for lots of regulation. Uh, we both work in an organization full of economists. So how, how do you see the way forward on this? Well, I know that there, amongst many, there may not be a greater appetite for regulation, but uh, I'm afraid it's coming because um, I mean, the recent statements, for example, from the head of the United States Security and Exchange Commission, um, in which uh, he said very clearly that we need to find ways to have um, SEC regulations or standards that apply to uh, this whole concept of environmental uh, of ESG investment. And I think that's exactly what the EU has done with the sustainable finance uh, uh, directive as well. And that's their first step. I mean, they will continue to uh, put increasingly uh, stringent requirements to support the credibility of the investment. This isn't to discourage investment. Uh, it may make it a little more challenging in the short term, but in the long run, it's going to make the credibility of the whole concept of ESG investment uh, uh, more sustainable, more, more credible. And again, that's where I think uh, you know, as, as uh, you know, Nick um, was pointing out, the voluntary nature of, of uh, for example, uh, use of proceed uh, bonds. Well, when the World Bank and uh, AIIB and other multilateral development banks uh, issue green bonds or social or socially responsible bonds, those are uh, uh, for projects that are required by contract to follow the environmental and social standards of those MDBs. And so there is an accountability and a traceability in those projects in which the investors can follow um, whether the, the, the projects meet the intended goals. Uh, and if not, then there's consequences. And you know, I could only say, because we mentioned climate before, but when we look at the fact that despite the trillions of dollars that are going into ESG, that on the key environmental indicators, and in some cases, some of the social indicators, uh, and in some cases, governance indicators and on certain areas uh, where there's allegations of corruption, a lot of those indicators are not going in the right direction. So I don't see any other way but to enhance sort of the regulatory approach. And this is where MDBs can work with regulators like stock exchanges uh, and find ways to help them build the credibility through their structures uh, for ESG investment going forward. Charles, just taking the cue on what you said and uh, you know having uh, Nick uh, working with the private sector, uh, particularly uh, in, uh, in capital markets, Nick, if uh, we go into this direction that eventually, you know, to have some measure of regulation, even if it is, you know, at the disclosure and uh, transparency base, do you see uh, any appetite for the courts in the United States to take on ESG enforcement? That's a great question. Uh, let me say uh, first to Charles that in my my sketch of how the market is composed, I, I I left out, and you correctly uh, reminded me, project bonds, which are really a different animal, where, as you say, uh, compliance with specific and detailed, um, especially environmental related standards, is a contractual feature of the instrument. And I, I should have made that a third bucket of my market, and one in which I think the efficacy uh, of sustainable investment is much higher than in pure use of pure use of proceeds bonds, and I would argue than it is in KPI bonds. So thank you for reminding me of that. Um, as far as the, uh, 
as far as the courts getting involved, you know, there's a there's a big question in the U.S. in the development of these regulations that, as Charles points out, are certainly forthcoming from the SEC. There's a big doubt about whether litigation will play a constructive role in promoting greater transparency and greater effectiveness of, uh, of companies meeting their sustainability objectives. And that doubt arises because the securities litigation system in the U.S. is, this is a topic for another panel, but I would argue that it is dysfunctional um, and imposes high and capricious external costs on actors in the system. Um, and th I think it will be very important for the SEC in designing a regulatory package applicable to the creators of assets to corporate issuers. It will be important for the SEC to think about how to create a system that has incentives in it that promote honest and transparent disclosure without also promoting uh, wasteful and burdensome litigation. Uh, so I don't see any uh, likelihood of the U.S. courts having the kind of enterprising and constructive attitudes towards uh, sustainable objectives of corporations that we've seen in some other jurisdictions and notably recently in the Netherlands. I don't see that happening in the U.S. As you know, the uh, judicial system um, as a consequence of political developments is far more conservative than the regulatory system or even the business community. And so I don't see the courts playing a constructive role. I do see a serious risk that the, uh, the role of entrepreneurial litigation will induce, will, will, will uh, prevent the development of useful transparency and prevent the development of the kinds of um, sustainability commitments and sustainability reporting that would really be, that would really serve the objectives that we all share. So I'm worried about the role of the courts. I'm optimistic uh, that the SEC will be, um, will be thoughtful about that, about that question. Thank you very much, Nick. Uh, we will eventually come back to uh, the point of, you know, self-disciplining and better uh, conceptualizing ESG in a moment with you and Charles and Sheila. But, you know, the world, the world today is full of liquidity. Uh, pandemic is, you know, thank God, going to a direction that we hope will be better in 2022. So projects will come back, both, you know, by the private sector, but also by MDBs and governments alike. Uh, all the three of you did touch on the issue of greenwashing, which is a very constant conversation we have here in Asia. Uh, let me turn to Sheila and ask the following question. How to ensure that the economic, economic recovery in the post-pandemic world takes full advantage of ESG approaches and does not become labeled as greenwashing? So I think that the first thing I, I think with the whole ESG space is that I think it has to move to an implementation level where it's, it's gone from just, you know, the talk to really what happens in practice. And I think part of the challenge here is that there's not that much awareness of what exactly it would entail. And as I'd mentioned, I think that one of the big issues is to have right from early design, you know, the kind of project preparation facilities to be able to set in motion and build capacities of countries and of different players to be able to design properly for ESG which I think, you know, sometimes uh, we maybe assume that you're go there's a movement towards, let's say, greenwashing when actually there's not enough capacity and not enough understanding or, or there's a perception that it's actually much more costlier. And so I think on the one hand, we need to look at the kind of technical support to be able to be provided to countries on how do you integrate ESG at the very early stage so that we get more players on board on the same page of what ESG constitutes and to be able to design with the kind of technical and financial standards that accommodate ESG. 
Number two is to be able to develop really standard data sets because otherwise it can be quite heavy in terms of the, the, the level of rigor that is needed to be able to really prove ESG um, criteria have been applied. And number three, I would have argued that actually it, you need to have some kind of, um, let's say, risk um, uh, risk mitigation approach so that uh, you're actually helping to buy down the risks so that more players can get involved in this. And because that would then involve the MDBs, the MDBs would then have a role in terms of really pushing the market towards um, environment and social governance criteria that are really up there and then can be validated in a way that that really keeps everyone on the same page without it being without risking it going towards you know seeing greenwashing. Thank you very much, uh, Sheila. Charles, uh, Sheila outlined three complementary ways, uh, very, very uh, familiar to us, you know, from the MDB. Uh, okay, we lost Charles uh, for the moment. Uh, when he comes back, please do let me know. Let me then move uh, to- uh, For Sheila, can I ask Sheila a question? Please, please go ahead, go I, ahead. Yes, go sure, ahead. Sure, I, I just, I, I, it's, it's an observation. Um, what you're describing, Sheila, the technical assistance to what I've been calling the creators of assets, I don't mean to be pompous, but the, the borrowers who mobilize funding and then commit to apply it in sustainable ways, my experience has been that their technical competence to determine whether and how their investments really do support their objectives is very limited. People in corporate environments and especially in some government environments uh, there's a big division between those who are in charge of raising funds and those who are in charge of making investments. And the people who are in charge of making investments do not have this expertise. So I, I wanted to second what you're saying about the incredible value to this market of providing technical assistance to the, to the creators of assets for whom funds are mobilized, providing technical assistance to them to figure out the how of making sustainable investments. And I wanted to ask you what, do you, what do you see as a promising model for providing that service? That is, um, who's, who's, uh, to whom do you provide, who, to whom can this service be provided by MDBs? Is it going to be a, uh, is it a, a, a service that, uh, who pays for it? I think that, you know, so we, we tend to look at the problem almost like, okay, there's as you as alberto says you know there's liquidity out there and and there are players out there who are looking to invest and to bring in financing the mdbs want to be able to to come in with sustainable you know, financing let's say that is green financing and there's a dearth of deals to be able to to fund them and on the one hand there's lack of capacity not just on the technical side but maybe even on the financial side in the borrower countries and it's always seen as either or. And I think that sometimes we need to be able to look and see how would we partner with in ways that would be completely out of the box, you know? So if I may take my own institution, you know, uh, UNAP, I mean, we've tended to stay with, you know, okay, how do we provide the ground financing? And I'm, and AIB, uh, other MDVs will be looking at their debt and equity financing. And I think actually here's where is an opportunity to link up together to be able to say, on the one hand, we need to have the kind of policies, the enabling environment, um, the kind of technical assistance to be able to jump over this hurdle, as you say, so that countries start to look more systematically up at the opportunities. And then to work with the MDBs to, to be able to create the kind of windows but not to fund one-off deals. You know, it's one thing to say, okay, we've got this billion dollar fund and it's going to just, it comes and goes. How do you create something that is more systematic in, let's say multiple countries where you have these investment platforms that take advantage of the national institutions that are placed and the private sector institutions that are in those countries so that you create a market and an interest in this that sustains beyond the, let's say the project and becomes something much more systemic. And I think here's where, you know, the, the climate financing mechanisms should be coming in to seeing how do they reduce the risk 
for investors to be interested in the space? How did they get us over the hurdle of the kind of financing needed to build the capacities? And here's where some very innovative financing mechanisms that would work and sustain beyond and the life of a single project is going to be quite key, I would think. Very good. Uh, I see that Charles is back, and then maybe I can connect uh, uh, Nick's uh, question to Sheila about how we can have this in a more integrated and have more impactful uh, with his experience in the MDB world. Charles was responsible for the World Bank accreditation with the Global Environment Facility and then with the Global uh, the Green Climate Fund. And one of the issues that we find is that uh, although we try to go in the, into the same direction, at times we don't speak the same language. So I wanted to ask Charles, in your experience in dealing with many multilateral development banks, what would be the best way to harmonize and standardize ESG approaches among MDBs? So not to confuse the client, especially the private sector client, and maximize results. What are the obstacles for reaching a harmonized approach? Thank you. Well, I think we are making progress. Um, I think, uh, you know, at each uh, annual meeting, uh, the sustainable development heads uh, get together. There's the multilateral development bank uh, uh, task force on climate finance. Um, so that harmonization that I mentioned earlier, I think is steadily going in the, the right direction. I mean, we have the multilateral financial institution working group on environmental and social standards. Uh, they have a similar group on on procurement, so I think we're we are really seeing consistency in the basic how you look at environmental, social, and governance impacts. But I think, as, as Sheila was pointing out, um, we can only look to MDBs to be a part of the much larger world of private finance. This is where I think both. You know, Nick and Chile are very correct in saying this is this is the engine that can lead to sustainability. We are the starter. We are the sort of the ignition for it. Um, and uh, you know, you often hear the statistic that you know, for every one dollar uh, of of uh, MDB finance in projects, we we hope we can leverage nine or or ten. It's that of leveraging that I think is quite key. The other where there can be going forward is the use of um, in, uh, instruments. Um, there are uh, there has been a shift uh, over time from uh, when MDBs did most of their finance through the and, and this is a very good point Chile made through the standalone project. And now we're seeing the effort at being more looking at programmatic lending, the greater use of using um, development policy lending to affect climate, social policy. Um, so there are ways to get leverage by not looking at just the one-off project, which I think did not get us the results that we need to the broader approach. And that includes using the MDB uh, relationship that's so strong with ministries of finance and, and treasuries to influence the approach on, on the regulatory uh, setting going, going forward. Um, one other really important point though, in this discussion is that this trajectory that we are all hoping to see in terms of uh, rate of return on sustainable investment is is challenged by the fact that globally we are still very much in a transition stage when it comes to how we move away from from industries or uh, energy sources that are seen as unsustainable to those that are uh, sustainable. It was a very interesting comment that the Norwegian Prime Minister made, I think, yesterday or the day before about the Norwegian feeling that they needed to continue to extract from their uh, North Sea oil in order to make the transition. So if you're investing in in any kind of that sort of operation in Norway, can you call it uh, sustainable finance? Uh, can you call it ESG finance? 
that would be a challenge. So these challenges will, will continue. Thank you very much, uh, Charles. Uh, obviously, when uh, we all designed this panel, uh, the energy crisis was not so clear in our <laughs> minds, which I think poses you know, additional uh, challenges uh, to us. One of the questions that came from uh, one of the colleagues that are you know, uh, watching us uh, tonight, uh, he uh, presented the following uh, uh, aspect for us to analyze. One is that, well, let's bring this you know, in a local level. Uh, you know, uh, in the exchange that we had between Nick and Charles, and then later on between Nick and uh, and uh, Sheila, we looked the, into the financial instruments. What about municipal bonds? Can we ha can we make a difference by you know trying to think globally and really act you know locally by financing uh, municipalities and using ESG as your parameter you know for finance? Let me uh, uh, provide you know present this question first to to Nick. And then you know uh, get uh, the comments from the the, the two of you, uh, Nick, please. Sure, thank you. I I admit I don't know a great deal about municipal finance in countries outside the United States. In the United States, it is of course at one level there's a long tradition of uh, investment in sustainable infrastructure through municipal finance. Um, I think in uh, Areas outside the U.S., I don't have as good a sense of whether um, that market can be mobilized in that way. Um, I will say to pick up on things that both Charles and Sheila have said that one important um, gap in the sustainability investment ecosystem is the inadequacy of intermediaries who assure comparability among investors and one of the major areas where the risk of greenwashing arises is precisely here where you have uh, asset managers that have to look at a very large number of investments and cannot diligence them in detail they rely on intermediaries that rate or score or rank uh, investments in terms of sustainability objectives those intermediaries at least the the kinds of actors that I represent are very mistrustful of those intermediaries. And I think the SEC has suggested also that they're very mistrustful of those intermediaries. Um, and Sheila mentioned earlier the possible uh, role of the technical capability of, of MDBs. I wonder if um, ranking or verifying or scoring investments um, in ways that ensure that they're really comparable is another role that MDBs uh, could play. And, and that would be important, for example, for municipal finance, where uh, one wants to be certain that an investment um, has been looked at by somebody other than the borrower. Thank you, Nick. Let me turn that, that uh, the last point that you mentioned about comparability uh, first uh, to Sheila. Sheila, you, you, you lead an important group, the economic group at UNAP, you have a global view. Are we anywhere near some comparability of these standards or having a common view? Uh, do the, for example, the SDGs give us any clue at this moment to reach you know, some compact when it comes to ESGs for a very clear and pragmatic instrument, such as, for example, uh, municipal bonds? Um you know, earlier in the panel discussion, I talked about our principles for sustainable banking and principles for sustainable um, investment uh, with PRI. And I wonder if you couldn't just do this for anything. I mean, you know, at the end of the day, that approach actually works in a voluntary manner, but it has a whole third party validation process. It's a transparent process where you can go in and look at the kind of reporting that um, these players are, are uh, you know, targeting and what they're reporting as their transition towards sustainability. And I wondered, in fact, when Charles was talking about the MDB network on climate finance, and I wondered if, if you could use that kind of a network to look at, say, something like principles for sustainable infrastructure that we have developed with partners and be able to say, okay, are the MDBs moving to this front? Couldn't you then use that in terms of the kind of financing mechanisms that you're that that are being applied, whether it's municipal bonds or project bonds or or proceed bonds? You know, it's possible that you could say, okay, the MDBs are moving in a very systematic manner 
towards this journey um, in their core core operations. And then here are the kind of financial mechanisms that are being used by different um, entities. And how many of these are actually applying ESG criteria? I would not think that there is, uh, you know, it, it means just having the enough of a, let's say, a momentum or a grouping of countries to be able to want uh, and players to be on or to want to be able to move in this direction to be able to set it up and to grow some of the networks that exist there um, in this way i think what would be very interesting is to see the kind of innovative partnerships that really like leapfrog to another level from what we have to thank you sheila we get the uh, legal and regulatory uh you know views from uh nick first and then you know the more programmatic, you know, policy orientation uh, from Sheila. Charles, uh, you know that in the MDB world, everything is uh, reduced to a project. So uh, how can we move forward without, you know, upsetting the whole balance, which is very difficult to do? Every uh, organization, they have their own budget, they have their own program. Can you try to make it into a project? Lots of these ideas aiming at, you know, valuing more the DSG approach? Well, I think what's really fascinating in, in this discussion um, is we have really a, a, a common approach uh, on the principles. And what I think um, is, is troubling is that and going back to your point, if I may, Alberto, on, on you know, Rio, going back 30 years, we've agreed on these kind of principles. And now um, we have these principles for investment. But as I said before, at, at project levels, at regional levels, at sectoral levels, we're seeing a lot of these sustainability indicators uh, going in the wrong direction. So if we're investing, for example, in agroforestry for the sustainability of, a, uh, of, of um, protected areas or forests or monitoring climate impacts, you know, we've seen instances where we had principles on sustainable fish, on sustainable forestry, on the extractive industries transparency initiative. And a lot of these have, have, have struggled because of the challenges to transparency, monitoring, verification. So how do we tackle those? At the project level, we require uh, monitoring by MDB staff at the project site to find out if indeed that project that was supposed to lead to afforestation or enhanced sustainability of the fish stock um, actually is there and it's reported and it's reported in a way that everyone can see as technology enhances and this is a big linking ago sorry to bring in the, the pandemic again but as we look at technology the use of whether it's satellite imagery uh individuals with their cell phones at a project site uh, there is going to drones there is going to be reporting on these indicators that will either give credibility to the project or prove or show that the project is not meeting um, its uh, its requirements the proceeds to use before. So I think that's the direction that you will see, uh, you know, our projects in, in going in the, the enhanced use of technology, hopefully forms of surveillance that ra raise other kinds of uh, challenging issues, but can lead to incentives, both um, individual and perhaps we could talk about the financial incentives that we may be able to form uh, in, in line with the objectives. So these are some big challenges uh, that I think we're going to see very soon uh, that we're facing already using these kinds of approaches. Thank you, Charles. And Nick, when you think about uh, you know these possibilities and those challenges, and you try to connect your typical client, big or small or medium, in Mexico City, in Rio de Janeiro, elsewhere in the world, uh, 
do you see any takers? Do you see any buyers? You know, how can we package this in a way that can entice the private sector? Because now we know, you know, that uh, there is no doubt that we need both public sector, private sector, international organizations, academia together in this. How do we bring the private sector to face these challenges? What the private sector is looking for, in my experience, at this juncture in this market, is intermediaries with credibility. And uh, the MDBs can play a really significant role because one thing MDBs bring to the table is credibility. If greenwashing is a real risk, the place where that risk resides is in the intermediation between investors, issuers, and, uh, and actual investments, and particularly in the conflicts of interest that afflict the um, economic actors that provide uh, these ratings and rankings and scorings that I was referring to earlier. MDBs can have the technical capacity to evaluate projects. Uh, they have the credibility to report on what they have learned. And I think there's a, I think there's a market for that. This, mark, this sustainable finance market at the moment is being driven by the suppliers of funds, but the borrowers really need uh, the kinds of service that Sheila and Charles have been describing, and I think there is absolutely a market for that. Excellent. Uh, I want to give some leeway. You know, we are approaching the end of our session. We have about 12, 13 minutes to go. I'm going to uh, pose, you know, a question for the three of you. And then, you know, do some exchange with some of the remaining questions that are coming from the colleagues uh, and the audience. So in what aspects do the panelists see ESG lacking to achieve its objective? And what are the near and long term challenges? Ladies, first, let me start with Sheila, please. I would say that um, the biggest one is the perception issue, the perception that it's going to be costly and that it's not going to draw a return. And so I think that some of the challenges is how do you buy down that risk? Um, it's, you know, it's going to be a long-term investment at the end of the day with sustainable in infrastructure, and there's a need to buy down that risk for, um, for investors. Um, I think from the government side, it has to be able to probably meet the costs of what it would for unsustainable infrastructure. I recently had a discussion with um, a colleague who was working in, uh, in the private sector as a CEO for, um, for uh, a coal power plant and a coal facility. And he said that, well, the government was looking for private investors because actually they weren't finding um, in, you know, an opportunity to be able to finance this at the, at the level of financing that would be needed. And here was a chance to be able to, let's say, export you know, power to the neighboring countries. And so I think there has to be a mechanism in which you can uh, bring down the costs from the MDB side. As mentioned earlier, I think there were, you know, I think in addition to the investor risk is the early stage project preparation support, the technical assistance support, and maybe also the policy and regulatory support. I was uh, intrigued to learn that, you know, in, in Canada, for example, the Ontario government set up legislation for pension plans to have to disclose ESG. Um, and on the, in France, the energy transition movement has also required um, investors to have to disclose ESG. Now we're seeing it in Japan, where the government's pension fund is having to uh, apply ESG criteria. So I think there's a space on the regulatory side. And then I think there's a space on the, on the market side and the voluntary space to be able to move those players who are interested in this and where MDBs have a key role in catalyzing those markets. Thank you, Sheila. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pass the, the floor to you, Nick, but with one uh, small provocation. Can the private sector take a little bit more risk as uh, uh, Sheila you know, uh, intimates here in, in her response? Because uh, we did touch on risk a few times during this discussion, but we didn't really address on you know, head on. So maybe a better equilibrium regarding risk is necessary for ESG to achieve its full potential. But the, the original question remains with the, the risk point added to you, uh, Nick. 
Thank you. Um, the private sector response to your question about risk will always be, who's compensating me for taking that risk? <laughs> and the market provides opportunities for a salutary answer to that question, because as we've discussed a couple of times, there's a lot of money looking for sustainable investment. I think the most constructive next step in all this uh, is in the area of verification and reporting and in the area of credible scoring, ranking um, of, of sustainable investments. Um, and that's that's the place where I think the, the MDBs can play the most important role. I do want to say, as the U.S. securities lawyer on this panel, that uh, people should be cautious about what they think the SEC can contribute uh, to this market. I think really, if, if I had to pick, I am much more optimistic about the contributions of the multilateral development banks than I am about the contributions of the SEC. Remember, the SEC has limited jurisdiction. It's a very effective regulator of corporate disclosure by reporting companies. That's a small part of the investment universe and a small part of the actors in the investment universe. It is not a very effective regulator of investors. It doesn't have jurisdiction over many of them, and it's not very effective with respect to many of those where it does have jurisdiction. Corporate disclosure, the SEC is going to do a lot. I'm hopeful that will be constructive. I mentioned some of the risks earlier. But uh, the, the SEC is not uh, the regulator that's going to uh, really advance the efficacy of the sustainable investment market. I think um, the, I'm much more optimistic, as I said, about the contribution of the MDBs. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Nick. And uh, you just gave me the perfect segue to uh, Charles, because we've been receiving some questions that about you know, the role of the SEC and a lot of you know uh, hopes that the SEC can actually police you know the ESG uh, uh, market and the ESG uh, instruments. So passing the question to Charles, in the in the if you agree with Nick that perhaps the SEC cannot do everything that some of our colleagues you know feel that they they could, uh, can some self-regulation, some you know independent accountability mechanism inside the companies? with, you know, agreed uh, ESG standards, uh, you know, be helpful in moving in terms of, you know, a common approach. But the remain the uh, gen the original question remains. Uh, what, what you see as ESG lacking to achieve its objective, objective and what are the near and long-term challenges with the additional point that I just made? Well, I think one thing is, I'm not sure we have a common definition of the term. Um, does ESG mean the same thing in, in Sudan that it means uh, in South Africa? I mean, the, 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 there are different actors, and I think this goes to what Nick was saying before, there's different rating agencies, there's, there's different indicator settings. Um, so one challenge is that we come to sort of a consistent approach. I think this is what the EU is trying to do. This in part is why the US SEC is is acting to ensure that investors have clarity on what it is they're investing in when they think they're investing uh, in, in ESG investments. So consistency um, in our concept, I think, is something that will uh, achieve over, over time. Um, but um, for wealthier nations, it's a lot easier to encourage uh, this kind of investment. They can take the risk uh, and they can probably find ways to subsidize uh, these kinds of uh, investments in order to green uh, certain investments that might not otherwise uh, not achieve uh, climate or social goals. So that, you know, there's a short term challenge in that we've got, you know, inconsistency across nation states in, in their approaches. And then there's a long term challenge in terms of um, will these investments indeed um, be successful because I think all of us have said that you know generally the, the fiduciary obligation of most companies is to have a rate of return and I think it in some cases they they will have shareholders that are questioning whether uh, these investments are going to uh, going to provide that um, there are also I think long term some of the challenges 
uh, we may see uh, trade implications as a result of those uh, those countries that may be setting investment uh, uh, limits on on what is a sustainable investment. Um, so th I think these issues will just continue for a uh, considerable amount of time um, for, for all of us. So I think we have to watch what the EU does, the SEC, what China does. China has been working with their stock exchanges uh, to help uh, provide clarity for what is a green investment. Um, and so it's it, it's happening all over, but it's somewhat fragmented. And that's what we were able to achieve with the MDBs is a harmonization in our approach on environmental and social standards. And I think that's what we probably will need to see over time with some of these in, uh, uh, you know investment houses as well. Thank you very much, Charles. Uh, I tried to uh, also weave some of the questions into the original uh, questions that uh, we had. Uh, some are coming from colleagues. Uh, one that came, I'd like to pass it to Sheila, it's more economic in nature. Can we really be hopeful that uh, at the end of the day, uh, we're going to be able to find economic value in the ESG approaches that are applied to regular projects? Um, well, if I, if I were to look at the UNAP principles for sustainable um, infrastructure, one of the things there is looking at, you know, the economic value. So beyond the, you know, just the, let's say, short-term financial gains and all is how does it appear in the bigger economic picture of things? Um, I don't know if it'll happen as fast because I think, uh, as Charles said, that, you know, you have investors and different players looking at the kind of return. So on the one hand, you have shareholders of some of, let's say, the institutional investors looking to see how do they have ESG criteria, and on the other hand, also wanting to have a return. Maybe the economic part will come in the longer term um, once there's, let's say, a, a level of faith that, you know, that there is, um, let's say, more investor appetite, and then we can look at, let's say, the bigger picture of what it will do in terms of economic benefits. Thank you very much. Uh, Nick, uh, an interesting question that uh, came in that I need to address it to you, which is, uh, can lawyers do a green pack, pact to ensure that they will not defend uh, companies engaged in greenwashing? That is a great question. There is a lot of pressure on law firms to comport themselves in a socially responsible manner in this space on law firms, um, law firms being among the more important employers of lawyers. So I, I assume, I suppose the question uh, relates especially to law firms. Uh, there's a lot of pressure on, on law firms to comport themselves in a socially responsible manner. Um, it is very difficult to measure it's really the problem is analogous to that that applies to borrowers or other creators of financial assets. It's very difficult to measure the credibility and efficacy of the commitments that uh, law firms and lawyers make. I would argue for uh, at the level of individual lawyers uh, that there is an emerging ethical consensus uh, with respect to certain kinds of social objectives and certain kinds of work that uh, serves those social objectives. And that consensus is very much in tension with the traditional, at least in the U.S., the traditional view of the responsibilities of the legal profession. I think it would be a promising idea to uh, ha to, to propose mecha a way, of, uh, an institutional setting in which law firms as actors in the economy could uh, speak with each other about how their actions contribute to the achievement of sustainable objectives. I don't think that institutional setting exists today. I, excuse me. Um, I don't think that institutional setting exists today. I think it would be a, 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 a fruitful idea. I think there would be a lot of interest among law firms, and I think especially among one of the key constituencies that law firms address, law firms in this respect are like many corporations, um, which is their employees. Um, and in, in, our, in our market, like in every market, um, and this is, I 
imagine this is true for MDBs as well. Survival is a matter of attracting the best talent and nurturing it. And um, people want to go and join institutions that are committed to these objectives. So for law firms to get together and uh, commit to, as I think your question was suggesting, commit to resisting uh, or not defending greenwashing, um, I think that's a promising idea. We're a ways from having an institutional setting in which that would work, but why not try it? Thank you very much, Nick. Uh, and Charles, uh, I'll leave perhaps the first question uh, to you, you know, perhaps uh, um, because you mentioned that, you know, ESG may mean different things if, you know, for different people and in different places. So we have a question uh, about the weakest link uh, that the one colleague in the audience uh, says in the SG, which is the social side. It can be very different. It can perhaps not, you know, be paid a lot of attention. Environment is, you know, highly regulated in many places. Governance has uh, gained notoriety uh, with respect to fraud and corruption. What about social? Uh, social safety net protecting, you know, the most vulnerable. What would be the best way to mainstream, you know, social values uh, by the MDBs in infrastructure development projects? Well, um, our member states uh, have, uh, in many cases, uh, adopted very progressive uh, either national laws or international agreements that we can help those uh, states uh, realize. And uh, like many social objectives in the world, these uh, can only be realized uh, progressively. Um, you know, all countries, I think, today are, are, are struggling to help uh, workers um, earn a decent wage and healthy working conditions. But, you know, as, as the nub of your question, Alberto, environmental success is typically more easy to measure from a scientific standpoint than is uh, the contentment of the human being. So what we have been doing over the last few years, and I think this is a very healthy development, is focusing not at our headquarters in understanding what's going on at the project, but at the level, creating mechanisms for stakeholders to engage and to do so in a way that's a safe space, that's a transparent space, and that they can then address directly, are the social objectives that we set in our projects being met? And if not, then we have an obligation to address those under the terms of our uh, engagement. So this goes back to, I think, sort of the early principle we've all agreed on is this need for accountability and transparency. And, you know, that doesn't mean in Beijing or Washington or London, that means at the project area where people are directly impacted on the ground. So I think that focus on providing direct access, open access, comfortable access for men and women and girls and boys uh, is, is a key to achieving that particular, uh, that S aspect of the ESG. Thank you very much, uh, Charles. Uh, I see that the clock now is ticking one minute and 30 seconds before the end of this uh, session. And uh, I wanna thank uh, all of you, the three of you very much for joining us tonight for me, perhaps afternoon for Sheila and in the morning uh, for my colleagues in North America. So we are nearing the end of our session. Uh, as we could see, SG represents both a promise and an implementation, you know, uh, possibilities and question marks. Although there is little doubt that the principles underlying SG concepts must be considered in development projects, there are still important questions such as how we can achieve sustainable goals. One consensus seems to emerge and emerge very strongly from this panel, that there is no uh, time to waste, the time to act is now. So let me once again, uh, thank our distinguished panelists, Sheila, Charles, and Nick for taking the time to be with us tonight and for shedding light on environment and social governance projects for development projects. I, in particular, i like to thank the members of my team very much for helping me to put this panel together. Legal counsel, Ben Whitelaw, 
Senior Business Management Officer Shua Yang, and Senior Administrative Assistant Lei Zhu. Uh, thank you so much for being with us tonight. Again, our panelists, our audience, and I hope to see you next time with another exciting topic during our annual meetings. Thank you very much and have a good day.